Well, hello everybody and welcome to Wednesday Night Life at... Well, look where I am. I'm in our uh, Sunday School building and uh, I'm really looking forward to bringing some kids in here. So uh, when we get going, please bring your kids, bring your grandkids, bring your great great grandkids and we'll teach them the Word of God and we'll love them and it'll just be wonderful. Uh, yes, I'm here because I have a special announcement to make, don't I, Jeannie? Yes. <laughs> My special announcement is we're opening up the church building. Now, when is that going to happen? Here's the really cool part. It's going to happen on my birthday. <laughs> of course, you all know when my birthday is, don't you? You don't? All right. June 7th is our go date. A couple of reasons for that. Number one is there's still some work, construction work, going on in the main sanctuary. And that's so that we can have it as beautiful as possible for you. Also, we're working on our guidelines, and I'm surprised at how many things have to be set in place in order to do this right. Apparently, uh, when we open, we'll still be under some, some restrictions. We can't have uh, more than 25% of the main sanctuary filled at any given time. So, and I know that there are some folks that have you know, <clears throat> situations where they don't want to come to church for whatever reason and be exposed to other people or expose themselves to other people. So we kind of have a workaround on that, don't we? Go ahead and come. We'll work on having some parking spaces. Uh, maybe we'll call them Facebook parking spaces. So you can come to church with everybody else, but you don't have to get out of the car. You can sit in your car and watch us on Facebook Live, which also goes on to uh, YouTube. And then uh, you'll be able to see everybody and wave to everybody uh, so that we get to see each other. My goodness, that'll be wonderful. So uh, we also have to make some arrangements too for, uh, we're calling them like these little, uh, you know, virus fighter stations wipes and hand sanitizer and that kind of stuff uh so and then after before services we have to clean after services we have to wipe everything down so i'm looking forward to that now uh, the governor doesn't want us to uh worship unless sing unless we have a uh, face mask on that's up to you we're going to space everything out so that it'll be possible for you to worship. But uh, if you'd like to, that'd be fine. They also ask that the preachers uh, wear a face mask, which is not going to happen. <laughs> I, just, I just can't see it. So let's do this uh, for tonight. Uh, go ahead and grab your Bibles and grab your refreshment. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking when people come back to church building, <laughs> everybody's going to be casual, you know. They'll be kicking their shoes off, and maybe we should have some recliners so it'll feel like you're at home. I don't know. Okay. Let's do this then. Uh, let's have a worship song, and then we'll come back, and then we'll have the Word of God, which is the main dish always at Calvary Chapel Life. God bless you. Again, I'm glad you're here. Let's have that special song.
Let's open up our Bibles this evening. We're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through 13 is what it looks like. And I'm calling this message, Flee, Follow, and Fight. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for this evening. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you, Father, that you've provided a safe place for us to meet and I ask, Father, that as we move towards that opening date, that you would give us wisdom. In fact, I'm asking everybody to pray that I would have wisdom in this, in making it as safe and as wonderful as possible, Lord, for the whole church family. So, Lord, we ask that you would be with us now. We ask you to light up your word, Lord, and we want to do this worship time for your glory and for our good. We ask this in Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody says, Amen. All right, uh, did you know that one of the meanings for the word sin is to miss the mark, to give something your very best shot, but to come up a little short? I came across a funny little story that illustrates this for us. Uh, it's a true story. It was an account of a new recruit on his first day on the rifle range at Lackland Air Force Base. He said, I felt confident as I aimed and squeezed the trigger of my carbine for my very first shot. After I had done that, the range instructor shouted, I have good news for you and I have bad news. The good news is you got a bullseye. But before the cause for any celebration could happen, he followed that up with, the bad news is it was someone else's target. <laughs> I, I bring this out because I want us to delve into the realization that we as believers in Jesus Christ, as his followers, we have a target. Yes, we do. We have a goal as his followers. And much like someone on the gun range, we need intention, we need purpose, we need focus, and the ability to take daily accurate aim at our target. Uh, as a matter of fact, before I go on, can I brag about our daughter, Lisa? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I've seen her on the gun range. I've been with her, and she is... <laughs> par excellence when it comes to target shooting. I've never seen anything like it. A lot of people have remarked about it. She actually has her NRA instructor's license, but uh, my, what I joke about her uh, is, is that she, uh, I ask people, do you know why Lisa shoots the first bullet? And they look at me like, what are you talking about? And I said, she does that 
so it can tell the other bullets where to go. There's been times when there's only the one hole, and I don't know how she does that, but praise God, we love her. She's awesome. Uh, just don't get her mad. <laughs> just kidding. So you see the word, it, we have to have this focus when it comes to our target in our faith. The word haphazard is never to be how the believer lives their life. Having focus, intention is much more what it's like for us who follow Jesus. You see, at our faith in Jesus Christ, we enter into a life with a whole new way of living, with a whole new way of looking at the world around us, and a whole new focus for what it is we're after. When we keep the love of God as for our lives as fresh every day, I know we've talked about that before, and we have this laser-like focus to hit the target of living that whole new life that we have in Christ. That's the ticket. So here's the view. Uh, or our new sights, you might say. Here's what it looks like. With our sins forgiven, with an awesome walk with the Lord with us at all the time, with this living hope as we look forward to this glorious future what that does is it frees us up to focus on a life following Jesus. What a grand adventure that we're on. I guess you could say that every day, believer, you and I are taking aim. We're taking aim with how we think and how we feel and what's in our hearts and the actions that we, those are all those are all shooting at a target. So let's now also consider this truth. We all know this, that in a fallen world, in a life that has trials and troubles, these things can throw us off our target, as well as the enemy of our souls can come along with doubts and temptations and reminders of the hurts of our past. And perhaps even there may be some missteps of other brothers and sisters of Christ within the church family that have us, I'm going to say it, at times wanting to throw in the towel. I quit. I'm moving far, far away. Away from accountability, away from, oh, that would not be right, would it? But it can have us maybe wanting to do that. And these things can also have us drop our aim and lose sight of our target. So the Apostle Paul knew quite a bit about overcoming distractions and overcoming obstacles. As you read about his life, the life that he led, he knew a thing or two about things that could throw us off course, off target. And as he writes to Timothy, that's where we're at today. He writes to Timothy, a son in the faith, he calls him. Also somebody, Timothy, who knew a little bit about trials and the difficulties of life, as what he is doing at this time is his very best to bring a church that had gotten off in the area of love and off in the area of gossip and off in the area of, of brotherly, kindness towards one another, and he was bringing them back on target. So that's kind of it. The book of Timothy is a, first Timothy is a book to bring a church back on target. And since it's a whole church, it's a way for us to come back on target if we're off or to stay on target, which is what each of us needs to do. It's living a life intentionally for the glory of God and for our good. So what I want us to take a look at tonight is some very practical, some very down to earth, ready to adopt clear instructions for staying on target and keeping your aim in the Christian life. Does that sound good? All right, let me read some of our verses for us. I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 through, <clears throat> let me go all the way down through 14. 
Paul the Apostle writes to Timothy, but you, O man of God, I don't want to leave the ladies out, so, O women of God, flee these things, we'll talk about that, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things before Jesus Christ who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. I think he's saying Jesus is our example even in the worst condition and times. Verse 14 says that you keep this commandment. Oh, this is interesting. Not just an instruction, but he's urging us and he's giving it the additional weight of it being a commandment without spot, blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ appearing. <laughs> that is so, so rich. Again, sometimes I find myself faced with verses where I think to myself, I can cut this into one study, uh, an hour at a time for each verse. I'm not going to do that, but I just want to let you know how rich this is and to encourage you to ponder these things even after this study, perhaps to take notes, perhaps to share it with somebody, perhaps to share this study and forward it to somebody. That would be good. So first, let's consider the title. What title am I talking about? It says, but you, O man of God or O woman of God, now, wouldn't that be something? See, Timothy's getting this letter from the Apostle Paul. What if you got a letter from the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it called you, O man of God, O woman of God? Wouldn't that be something? I like that. So from now on, instead of calling each other, hey, bro, or hey, sis, let's call each other, hey, man of God, or hey, woman of God. I don't know. I would... Immediately, this signifies to me that there must be something different about Timothy. I mean, you just don't call everybody a man of God. It must mean that there's something separate about Timothy from the rest of the world to get a title like that. Something special about him in the way that he lived, in the way that he talked, in his conduct. And guess what? That's the same for us. Oh, man of God, oh, woman of God. There's to be something different about us. We're to display, and not by us, but by God's spirit within us. God wants to use your life to display to others godly qualities so that the world would see what it is that it's sadly lacking and is in desperate need of. It has been rightly said, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. Isn't that great? Well, Timothy is special. He was given a job to do under the authority and the accountability of his spiritual father in the faith. The Apostle Paul put him on this task with the leading of the Holy Spirit. So I want to tell you something. You're special. You're loved by God. And your Father in heaven has a plan. In fact, if you want a claim to fame in your life, oh, people like that, you know? Have some claim to fame, you know? They call it uh, hitting the high note in life, hitting the high note. If you want to hit the high note in your life, if you want to claim to fame in your life, let it be this, that you know that God your Father has a plan for your life and it is your joy to keep on target with that plan and to bring him glory. That's the high note for every single believer in Jesus Christ. Now, Oh, man of God is actually a title. It's something that would have rung a bell in uh, Timothy's head. Oh, man of God is actually a, it's 
a title given to prophets in the Old Testament. Yeah, those who spoke for God were called, O man of God. Isn't that beautiful? So Timothy would have heard that. He would say, oh my goodness, Paul the Apostle is referring to me in the same way that prophets who spoke for God in the Old Testament were given that very same title. That had to be very encouraging. But when I use it for you, O man of God, O woman of God, it means that you too are to speak for God in this world. You are to let God's word so be absorbed into your heart that when you open your mouth, what's in your heart spills out of it. And what you've already put in your heart is the word of God. O man of God, O woman of God. Now notice, uh, Paul lays out Christian faith for Timothy. And what it is that he is laying out, I think, falls into these three categories right here. And I, I, I've thought about it, and this kind of overlays several places in the teachings of the Apostle Paul for you and for me. And here they are, that Timothy is to flee something, and then he is to follow something, and then what he is to do is to fight to maintain it. So flee, follow, and fight. That is pretty much the Christian victory in a nutshell. So first, let's talk about the fact that Timothy is supposed to flee some things. <laughs> and we're supposed to flee some things. Like, uh, we like Timothy are to flee. And by the way, the definition of the word flee is to run. <laughs> Do you find it interesting that, uh, that the Apostle Paul would begin this instruction to Timothy with, with run away from something? Here it is, believer, run. That's the definition of flee. So what kinds of things does the Apostle Paul want for we believers to flee from? And he really gives that in the verses that are up above where we started. So let me just read that for us. And I want to be reading in the New Living Translation. So um, starting in verse 4, Paul the Apostle writes to Timothy, Anyone who teaches something different, different basically from Jesus, is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meanings of words. This stirs up arguments, ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. That's quite a list. And Paul is talking about what can happen in a church. Doesn't this break your heart? Doesn't this make you want to run from such things? He goes on in verse 5. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt. They have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Wow. Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, that's for sure. Uh, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. Has anybody seen that funny picture of a, a U-Haul trailer being pulled by a hearse? It's, that's the idea. So we have enough food and clothing. Let us be content. Not always grappling with somebody, not trying to look wiser than somebody else or no more than somebody else. That is backward. But people who long to be rich, this is another area to flee from, fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. He goes on to say, you ready for this one? For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money 
have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. That's heavy. Do you know that Jesus said you cannot serve God and money? Have you heard that one? You see, here's the conflict that comes up once you start craving money rather than trusting God to meet all your needs and just doing what's right in his sight. What happens is for some folks, it ends up bringing them to a place of compromise. They'll be like, well, I'll just cheat a little bit on my income tax or uh, you know, I'll just take this that doesn't quite belong to me, but it's okay because I need the money. And so there comes that conflict and the Lord Jesus says, you got to take a pick. You're going to serve me or you're going to serve money. You can't have both at the same time. Now, Jesus also went on to say from there, he said, uh, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrodes where Thieves can't break in and steal. I'll tell you, let me ask you, how's your heavenly bank account doing? Have you made any good deposits into your heavenly bank account? Because those are uh, eternal interests rewards. <laughs> Better than any other plastic card can give you, that's for sure. So uh, be careful of these things. Though the, these are the those things that Paul is telling Timothy and telling us to run away from. I put these under the category, really, what you're to run away from, really, is anything that is not like Jesus. Not like Jesus, I'm out of here. Now, if I were to boil this down for us, I would say, watch carefully the word of God you hear and let it alone be the thing that governs your conduct. So the word of God, theology, and your conduct. Let those match. You see, the people of God has placed in our life, the ones that don't know him yet, those people that God puts around us. He did that intentionally, by the way. So be careful when you say, get me out of here, Lord because he could have parachuted you right into that position so that others around you would be able to look at you and then make some decisions about Jesus based upon how you live and how I live and by what we do and by what we don't do in the word of God. Here's a quote from you for you, and I'll tell you who said it afterwards. You ready? This is just great. Here it is. Do God's will. It's not a matter of right or wrong. The question is, does it please God? Don't live by the morals of our society. Live by the commandments of God. We are to do his will. Let that be the standard by which you live. You know who said that? My pastor, Pastor Chuck Smith, who is right now with the Lord, and I know that he made many deposits into the bank of heaven, didn't he? So I love that. Thanks, Pastor Chuck. <laughs> so we are to flee. We are to run from the old style of living that we had before we put faith in Christ. Just run away from it. Uh, this is written in a way that makes it an imperative. I think I've already stated this is a commandment, so it goes beyond just a simple instruction. This is a command uh, that we must right away move away from the old self-centered life. But hey, don't just be known by what you don't do, but be known by what you do. Fleeing. And following is God's transformation process for your life, fleeing and following. Verse 11, let me read it again. But you, and as a matter of fact, the words but you is really setting up a kind of a contrast for us. Can you see that? Contrast from the old life to the new life. Here's the old life, flee these things. But you, 
O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Those are the targets for us. By the way, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Who does that sound like? Doesn't that sound like Jesus? Not only does it sound like Jesus, but it is to be a good and proper description of the maturing Christian. Pursue righteousness and godliness. That means to be right with God and to be right with others. And it follows that godliness, oh, this is my little saying, godliness is Jesusness. <laughs> Pursue Jesusness. And pursue means to get after it. Put the pedal to the metal, will you? Pursue means to go for it. Pursue means to be more like Jesus, the one who sacrificed his life for you and for me on the cross. Jesus is the beautiful example of other-centered living. He lived for others. He said, I came to do my Father's will, not my own. You know that uh, slogan from years back? In fact, there were some bumper stickers with it. WWJD, right? What does that stand for? What would Jesus do? I haven't heard that for a while. Maybe we ought to be the ones that revive it. Also, on our target list then is faith, love, patience, and gentleness. These may not be important to the world at all. The world may not take recognition of these things, but they are to be of great value. No, wait, let me go beyond that. It's not, it's not just great value to it. It's pure gold for the believer. These things are golden for the believer. Lo faith, love, patience, gentleness, pure gold. That's the life of the believer. That is bringing glory to God and to be nothing but good in our own lives. I, I got a, uh, I got a text uh, a while back from... Uh, from a young person, <laughs> let's just say that. And we went back and forth texting for a little bit about living for Jesus. And uh, the text that I got talked about the fact that this young person used to do certain things and used to live in a certain way, but assured me that all those things were left behind and now the goal was to live for Jesus. And I said, to, I texted, back you know what you what you are telling me is that you are actually by doing this by making this commitment you are actually blessing your future self <laughs> isn't that great blessing your future self by pursuing these things so these are to be our life pursuits these are to be the christian's bucket list if you will uh, in order to be a man or a woman of God. So first flee, and as we flee one thing, we are headed for something else, something wonderful. So that comes the fleeing, then comes the following. And we are letting go of this world in exchange that, and in order that we might follow after Jesusness after godliness, you know, like the things we just mentioned. So let me kind of run down them real quick for us. So uh, the next necessary thing or within the target of following is faith, uh, which we know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So that's something that we must have. Now we all have faith. The Bible tells us that a measure of faith is, to given, is given to everyone that comes into the world. So you have faith. The thing is, what do you do with your faith? Where do you place your faith? Is your faith placed in yourself or in your bank account or your good looks or your job or whatever it may be? We're to take our faith and we're to place it in Jesus Christ. And uh, that's, what, that's what we do with our faith. It is putting it on Jesus and putting it to work. All right, the next thing is love. And that's what the world needs now, is love, sweet love. 
That's the only thing that there's just too little of. Do you know that song? <laughs> anyway, so love happens to be the one thing that everything in the Bible hinges on. Love is the one thing that all of the word of God hinges on. Love God supremely and love others as you love yourself. The next is patience. And I'll bet you couldn't wait for me to get to that one. Get it? Patience, waiting for me to get to patience. Anyway, how are you in the patience department? And I would ask that you not rate me in the patience department. Let me give you a quote from E.M. Bounds. He wrote, I think Christians fail so often to get answers to their prayers because they do not wait long enough on God. He goes on to say, they just drop down, say a few words, then jump up and forget it and forget expecting God to answer them. Such praying always reminds me of the small boy ringing his neighbor's doorbell and then running away as fast as he could go. And he rounds out our pursuits with gentleness. So let's think about this for a moment. We're supposed to be patient, that's tough enough, but then follow up your patience with gentleness. Let me ask, how gentle do you feel after you have been waiting and waiting and waiting? <laughs> I fear that too often, here's our attitude. I'll be patient as long as you don't make me wait. That, that didn't work. <laughs> but I think we act like that, don't we? That attitude is neither patient nor is it gentle. You want an, ex you want an example of that, don't you? Okay, I'll give it to you. How about you and Jesus? Hasn't he been patient with you? Hasn't he been exceedingly patient? Hasn't he been slow to anger? And then in the end, after he's waited and waited, what's he like? Gentle. Come to me, he says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? That's so kind. It's so inviting for God to treat us in that manner, to treat us with great patience, followed up by great kindness. Years ago, there was a song, I don't know if you remember this one or not, I think in, we think in songs, don't we? Always we're thinking of songs. The name of the song was It Don't Come Easy. I don't know if anybody remembers that or not. So as you are fleeing, fleeing wrong things and following right things, sometimes it will feel like that's an absolute fight. Sometimes you will be pressured to stay when you know you ought to go. Sometimes you will feel pressured to back up when you know that you're supposed to be going forward. It just feels sometimes like a flat out fight. But wait a minute. It is a fight. Did you know, believer, that you're in a fight? Every day as you take aim to follow Jesus Christ, it's going to be a fight. Don't just lay there. Put up a fight. That's what this is talking about. We have to put up a fight. The reason why is because fleeing and following, it just don't come easy. It doesn't just happen. We must purpose in our hearts every day, sometimes moment by moment, to stay on target. Who knows by heart? Jesus saying this, if anyone comes after me, let him deny himself. That sounds like fleeing. Let him deny himself, take up his cross. That's the fight and follow after me. Same principles are right there. There are just no shortcuts to, to staying on target. There's no shortcuts. You got to do it every day. You got to be after it. You got to put up a fight. Verse 12 starts out by saying this, fight the good fight of faith. Now, as I was studying this, I thought to myself, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. 
Uh, I've never seen that on a tombstone. But that might be pretty good, huh? He or she fought the good fight of faith. And if you want to know what that is telling us, is it's right there, a biblical uh, acknowledgement that it really is a fight. To do this, you will be going against the current of the world. And sometimes we will get tripped up. We may even fall down in the fight to do right. But when that happens, get up, brush yourself off, flee and follow, and then determine to get right back into the fight. Verse 12 continues, lay hold of eternal life. Isn't that an interesting uh, wording? Uh, eternal life. <clears throat> grab a hold of it. Lay hold of eternal life. This is like something that you grab a hold of and you never let go. It's like saying, get fully engaged in your faith. Are you fully engaged in your faith? Like saying, attach yourself to Jesus Christ. Like saying, run the race. Like saying, keep on keeping on with your bad self. <laughs> keep on keeping on for Jesus. Verse 12 continues, to which you were also called, that's to eternal life, you were called to eternal life. If you don't know Jesus Christ as you're watching this, you're called to eternal life right now through the word of God. You were called and you have confessed, so these are actual believers, the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. You know what that tells me? A lot of people know you're a Christian. You've talked about it. You've said some things, maybe just by the way you act. My goodness, back when I was working with AT&T, they were always trying to get me to go to happy hour, which by the way, happy hour is the saddest bunch of people I've ever seen. They're not happy. They're not. That's not happy. And so uh, we're to put up a fight. Uh, we have made this confession before people that we're a believer. And they're going to be watching us. One time I did go and I ordered a nice tea. Just thought I'd let you know that. Up oh, with a lemon and a, a sprig of mint. Just thought I'd let you know that. So, uh, uh, folks know you're a Christian. Uh, and who knows you're a Christian? Well, let's start off with your spouse knows you're a Christian. Oh my goodness. How about your kids? How about your parents? How about your neighbors? And of course, the people that you work with, your family and friends. That's why he says in verse 13, I urge you in the sight of God. In other words, this is for real. This, this saying, I urge you in the sight of God, to me, that's like saying this is serious business. You don't toy with your faith. You don't, you know, it's not like you put your left foot in, you put your left foot out. <laughs> you know, you get all the way in. You don't, you don't drift. We've talked about that already. You don't go on vacation. We've talked about that already from your faith. There's no layoffs in the kingdom of God. So he says, I urge you in the sight of God who gives life to all things. And that's just, that's just make it a real powerful statement of who it is that we must give an account to. And before Christ Jesus, then he gives Jesus as an example of being a witness before other people. He says, Jesus who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. He's like saying, you notice Jesus? He didn't back off, he, not one bit. He kept on. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Just like we would say that same thing. My kingdom's not of this world. I don't want a payday here, do you? <laughs> I want a payday in heaven. I don't want the world to say, good job, Paul. I want Jesus to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now listen. For the fleeing and the following and the fighting. I know we just don't have enough oomph 
of ourselves to get that job done. So we need supernatural power. These things are out of reach for us. So check this out, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. In other words, God has deposited within these fallen creatures his truth, his word, his love, his Holy Spirit. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So I continually stay humble. I exit the pride, which we all have to do, and I rely totally on the power of God and not thinking that these things can be done, fleeing, following, and fighting on my own power. I must lean on the Lord at all times. Yes, the Lord will work these things out, and I believe that it's even his desire to see these things worked out even through our weaknesses, even because of our weaknesses, so that we will look back, so that others will look and say, I know that's not him. I know that's not her. That's got to be God. That's got to be God who's doing that work. So count on God to do it. The Old Testament prophet, man of God, Zechariah said in Zechariah 4, 6, it's not by might, it's not by your guns, <laughs> it's not by power, we don't have much, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, how important that we not grieve the Holy Spirit. Oh, how important that we walk with the Holy Spirit. Oh, how important in our times of trial and hurt that we allow the Holy Spirit to comfort us and strengthen us and build us up and pick us up and teach us the Word of God and open our eyes to understand the Word of God so that the Holy Spirit can work through us, not of ourselves, but of Him. We know that whatever it is that God calls you to, God will also provide for you the power to do it. That's what this is talking about. Can I just read uh, our verses again over us? But I'm going to read this from the Phillips translation as we begin to close off here. He writes, But you, the man of God, the woman of God, must keep clear of such things. Set your heart not on the riches, but on goodness, Christ-likeness, faith, love, patience, humility. Fight the worthwhile battle of faith. Keep your grip on the life eternal to which you have been called, to which you boldly profess your loyalty before many witnesses. Don't you like how he worded that, especially that end part? Don't you profess your loyalty to Jesus in front of others? I'd rather have Jesus, that's another song, than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. That's just a beautiful thought there. So here we go, in review, are you ready? These are the things we covered. We are to stay on target with Jesus. Will you do that? Will you stay on target with Jesus? I'll do it with you, we'll do it together. And we are to flee, follow, and fight. We are to flee what is not like Jesus. We are to follow continually after Jesus, and we are to fight the good fight of faith to stay on target. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for tonight. I thank you, Father, for this time that we're able to spend together. I thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is even here now with us and at the homes of those who are listening and in the ears and in the hearts of those who hear this message. And on account of that, Lord, I would just like to say to those out there who may be listening in on this teaching, maybe in your heart of hearts, you know that it is the Lord that has a call on you 
and his call on you is for eternal life. And so now is your opportunity. The Bible even says today is the day of salvation. It's not a complicated matter. You feel the tug of the Lord on your heart. You know these things to be true and you make the decision. And you tell the Lord, Father in heaven, I'm ready to leave my old life. In fact, I want you to help me now, Lord, to run away from my old life because I determine now to follow after you. And with your power, I'll be able to fight the good fight of faith and stay on target with Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. Be my God, be my Lord, be my Savior. And I'll follow you all the days of my life. And if you're out there and you're listening and, you, and these things maybe seem, uh, to some they may seem new, this whole concept. To others, it may seem like old hat, but the real question is, is not what you know. The real question is, is are you doing it? We're not just here to store up knowledge. We're to hear it's serious business before God our maker. We've been called to follow Jesus Christ. And God will help you to do that, and he'll help me to do that. Father, it's in Jesus' name that I lift up before you those who are answering the call of eternal life right now. I lift up before you, Lord, your word that it draws us back in. I lift up before you, Father, any believers who are listening, who are determining that they want to be mature Christians, not just pushed around by the world any longer, but they want to confess their loyalty to Jesus Christ before everybody and before all to see. Again, Lord, I thank you for your word. We pray these things tonight in Jesus' awesome name. And together everyone says, amen. amen. You are loved. Looking forward to seeing you soon on my birthday. Remember that, you know, just thought I would mention that once again. <laughs> uh, we'll open up the church building. Please come join us. It's going to be fun to see your faces. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.